welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's discussion and book launch. My name is Alyssa Ayers and I'm Dean of the Elliott School. What an honor it is to be able to host former Prime Minister of Australia, the Honorable Kevin Rudd here today. He has a new book out. That's what brings us together today. One that is on a weighty question central to all of our futures. And that is the US-China relationship. His book titled The Avoidable War, The Dangers of a Catastrophic Conflict Between the US and Xi Jinping's China is just out today. So hot off the presses and it's already received praise. Given the deteriorating relationship between Beijing and Washington and the urgency of the relationship between the United States and China, I do expect that this book will spur intensive conversation in the months ahead. But without further delay, and bear with us while we fix the tech issues, let me introduce our speaker as well as our moderator for today's event. The Honorable Kevin Rudd became President and CEO of the Asia Society in January 2021, and he has been President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, a think-do tank, since 2015. Rudd began his career as an Australian diplomat in Beijing before entering Australian politics, where he served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister from 2007 to 2010, then as Foreign Minister from 2010 to 2012, before returning as Prime Minister in 2013. As Prime Minister, he led Australia's response during the global financial crisis, co-founded the G20, and drove the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. He also drove Australia's successful bid for its non-permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council for 2012 to 2014, saw the near doubling of Australia's foreign aid budget to approximately $5 billion and delivered his country's formal apology to indigenous Australians. Rudd also currently serves as chair of the board of a UN think tank, the International Peace Institute in New York, is one of 12 members of the IMF Managing Directors External Advisory Group, and is a member of the Global Leadership Council for Sanitation and Water for All. Rudd graduated from the Australian National University with honors in Chinese studies and is fluent in Mandarin. He also studied at the National Taiwan Normal University in Taipei. Our conversation today will be moderated by our own Professor David Shambaugh, the Gaston Seeger Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs. And he is the founding director of the China Policy Program here at the Elliott School. He was formerly a non-resident senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at the Brookings Institution and director of the Asia Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He also worked in the US Department of State and the National Security Council. He served on the board of directors of the National Committee on US-China Relations and is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations of the US-Asia Pacific Council and other public policy and scholarly organizations. Before joining the Elliott School faculty, Professor Shamba was lecturer, senior lecturer and reader in Chinese politics at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies from 1986 to 96, where he also served as editor of the China Quarterly. So we have two experts of great renown here with us to talk about the United States and China. I will now turn things over for initial remarks from the Honorable Kevin Rudd. We look forward to your remarks and the conversation to take place afterwards. Oh, good day. Good to see you all. The, um, good to be here at. Uh, uh, George Washington University, the Elliott School, and with uh, Professor Shamba, uh, and with all of you. Um, earlier today, as just been mentioned, I was uh, pleased to launch uh, this book of mine. Uh, the, there's a picture of it somewhere, uh, The Avoidable War. Um, we had uh, Senator Mitt Romney. Thank you very much, David. Um, as, they, as, as we say in the classics, buy early, buy often. Um, or as Mayor Daly used to say in Chicago, vote early and vote often. So the, uh, we, I was pleased earlier today to have uh, Senator Romney uh, launch the book for us down at the Willard. Brought to mind the importance of this country, the United States, uh, crafting a long-term bipartisan, enduring strategy to deal uh, with uh, China's rise, of which we have perhaps the elementary beginnings right now. I'm going to speak to you for not longer than 20 minutes, and I'll try and address just three subjects. Uh, one, uh, why, what does history tell us about where we have reached with China and the United States today 
Two, what do I mean about this concept of managed strategic competition? And does it have any practical utility at all, or is it just something that academics can sound uh, self-important about? Um, not that I've ever found an academic who's self-important. And uh, I've found more politicians who are much more self-important. And the third is a few reflections from me about what is now unfolding in the strategic triangle between Beijing, Moscow, and Kiev uh, about the future trajectory of US China as well. So, a few lessons from history. You all know that uh, history never repeats itself. You all know Mark Twain, but there are rhymes and rhythms which continue to emerge uh, from historical events which we've mapped and recorded whatever our historical or historiographical biases may be. But when I look back at the bloody history of the 20th century, there are two or three lessons which for me stick in the back of my cerebral cortex and occasionally excite my amygdala as well. Um, <clears throat> the first is this. It is the enduring lesson of 1914 in July of that year. How was it, as my compatriot Christopher Clarke in his book, The Sleepwalkers, how Europe sleptwalked into World War I? <clears throat> how did that actually happen? When if you go back into the history of the time, none of the great powers in 1914 wanted a war. Very few expected a war or believed it was possible. And in fact, <clears throat> when it came to five minutes to midnight, neither monarchs or prime ministers or diplomats were capable of preventing it. A diplomacy demonstrably, catastrophically failed. And so, um, if you've read uh, also Keegan's monumental history of the First World War, uh, the trains of mobilisation uh, began rolling. Uh, the mobilisation processes for that war have been modelled on the use of trains for the mobilisation of troops in the Civil War in this country. And then the catastrophe, which was the war to end all wars, the Great War, World War I, uh, then scarred the planet and changed geopolitics forever. Sleepwalking is kind of less, lesson number one. Lesson number two in my mind is uh, the lesson of the 30s, and that is the dangers of appeasement or the appearances of appeasement. We all know what happened. One by one, as uh, Hitler pushed the door, uh, and one by one, he found that there was no resistance on the other side, starting from 36 and cultivating with Poland in 39. This untidy sequence of geopolitical events, certainly from the perspective of the British, but I think also a contemporary France, the two mainstay European great powers at the time, um, and an isolationist America, um, produced a view on the part of uh, the authoritarian leaders of Europe at the time that you could simply continue. And the result, we all know, catastrophic and comprehensive conflagration. So the dangers of appeasement, and that is if you simply say to dictators, um, we don't approve of what you're doing, but we're not going to do anything robust to prevent you from doing what you're doing, then the lesson which is taken strategically from that is one of weakness. Lesson number three, in my mind, um, comes from the period of the Cold War. And as you know, and as you may have read, and some of us are just old enough to remember, uh, the multiple times in which the United States and the Soviet Union came to blowing each other's brains out uh, during the Cold War was enough to turn any uh, man's hair white. Uh, this, of course, came to its most dramatic climax in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62. And what is the enduring message there? It's a complex message, but it's one about the importance of deterrence, the importance of detente, and the importance of diplomacy at the highest levels. So when you pull all these uh, lessons from history together, uh, they represent a series of sober instructions 
for those of us in the 21st century, trying to carve a peaceful future for the planet, a sustainable future for the planet, but one which does not yield on the question of freedom. Easy to say, very hard to do. Of course, history is more complex than the three grand narratives I've just referred to, and each of those is contested enormously in the academy. But um, if you add to it what the 20th century and the early 21st century is, has had to say to us about the impact of economic globalization. Uh, mutual economic dependence, whether it's in goods markets or capital markets or technology markets or talent markets, while it may lessen the likelihood of conflict, crisis and war, does not remove it. In fact, those of you who are students of the First World War will know that it erupted in 1914 in a period of unprecedented globalization back then. <clears throat> Uh, as Europe had experienced with the technology revolution beginning really with the birth of the railways in the 1840s, this whole sense of seamlessness across borders, which had hitherto not been possible, unless you were crusader forces rampaging from one end of Europe to the next on your way to uh, liberate Holy Jerusalem. And so the economic uh, factors driving degrees of interconnectedness have been a huge factor since globalization in earnest unfolded in the 80s, the 90s and the noughties, but still with its limits. Remember, you have the two economies in the world most economically intermeshed with each other at every level, trade, FDI, uh, as well as financial markets, and until recently capital markets. Uh, now, with semi daggers drawn in terms of the future nature of the global order, that's China and the United States. And beyond uh, all the above, there is uh, one other factor which looms from the late, from the early nineties, but through into this century, and that is uh, the lesson of global governance. And when you have a global commons which demands global governance, of which climate change looms first centre and foremost, then the enduring lesson of the late 20th century and the early 21st century is unless uh, we uh, cooperate, then there's no way and globally we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions to the extent that we need to keep global temperature increases within four degrees increase centigrade by the end of the 21st century. At present, we're on track for a 2.6 degree increase, which would still be catastrophic. And given the most recent outbreak in hydrocarbon disease, as I would call it, in response to the geopolitical crisis uh, emerging out of Ukraine, compounded by uh, what existed before uh, through OPEC and other factors, uh, means that the challenge for the global commons and global environmental commons, of which climate is principal, uh, remains uh, real and compelling. As I said earlier this morning, if uh, Thomas Paine was rewriting common sense in the 21st century, rather than being a good revolutionary track back in 1776, it would be about the common sense of collective action on climate change, except we don't have any common sense right now. So where does all that leave us in terms of US-China? And what do we take from those various narratives uh, into the framework which I seek to enunciate in the book which I've launched today, The Avoidable War? I have a pretty simple view of the world. I'm not trained, by the way, as an international relations scholar. I'm trained as purely a Sinologist, a student of Chinese language, a student of Chinese history. Um, and, and then I began creeping down the food chain of life into national politics from scholarship through diplomacy and then really hitting rock bottom by ending up as prime minister of my country. <laughs> the, um, but when I had a real job as a China scholar, which I'm seeking to return to slowly but surely over time, um, when I look at these questions of where the United States and China have landed today, and without an extensive historiography um, or uh, objective analysis of what factors have contributed, to the current state of the relationship. Structural factors like greater Chinese power and lesser relative American power in all the categories of power. And as Xi Jinping would say to the various National Party Congresses of China, comprehensive national power has changed. Uh, 
Um, and then as a consequence of the above, we are seeing uh, changes in the world that we have not seen in 100 years. And that we have seen also uh, the rise of the East, the fall of the West, uh, which is code language for the rise of China and the fall of the United States. Even we stupid barbarians get that, by the way. Okay. Um, so, yeah, no need uh -huh. so um, for those reasons, um, uh, you've got structural factors at work around the material dimensions of the uh, balance of power between the two countries, which our friends in Beijing study meticulously as good Marxist Leninist dialecticians and those who are committed to the disciplines, as they would describe it, of historical materialism as well and the unfolding nature of changing events. But in addition to that, to add the subjectivity of personality politics and someone called Shidara, um, and uh, when you look at Xi Jinping and uh, throw that on top of the changing structure of uh, US-China relations in terms of the underpinning balance of power and the personality of Xi Jinping and his um, uh, notion of being a Dalin uh, Xiu, a great leader um, who is going to bring about uh, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people with Afu Xi, and by mid-century, by 2049, coincidentally, 100 years since the founding of the People's Republic of China, but who's counting? <laughs> uh, then you see a personality in a Carlylean tradition of history, the history of great men, uh, which then in the midst of these changing structural factors in uh, US-China relations, uh, in the military balance, economic balance, the technological balance, et cetera, of power, then we end up in a highly, uh, highly toxic environment. Then you throw into the admixture uh, what happened under the Trump administration uh, when I still fail to be able to make sense of what actually happened in the Trump administration, but I'm sure a lot did, but most of it from US national interest point of view, destructive. In fact, if you read carefully the Chinese texts, which accompany the, China, the Trump administration being in office here in Washington, it is, that, it is only in that four year period that you begin to see China's rhetoric about a radical change uh, in the international situation favorable to China because of three sets of external developments. One, the legacy impact as they have analyzed it in Beijing of the global financial crisis. And what that did in their view, I think largely wrong view, of gutting the internet in the underpinning intellectual power and authority of the United States. Two, in their right view, uh, the impact of the Trump administration, the diminution of America's global standing uh, around the world and particularly among its allies, but also the rendering asunder of America's ability to internally govern itself effectively. The third factor, uh, was, God bless his soul, Boris Johnson, ripping the heart out of the chest of Europe and by stupendously, stupidly uh, taking Britain out of the European Union. Not that I have strong views on this subject. <laughs> bad for Britain, bad for Europe, weakening both. But if you're sitting external to this, as a good Marxist, Leninist, dialectician, historical materialist in the research institutes in Beijing and what's left of them in Moscow, the conclusion you would reach is uh, we're doing okay, we've got our problems. Um, look at these three big factors unfolding in the West. Who could believe our luck that this madman called Trump could have been elected? And then you have the madman called Boris who's taken Britain out of Europe and the underpinning problems of uh, legacy problems in the global economy from the global financial a crisis and accumulated collective debt across the developed world. So having contradicted myself entirely and not reflected therefore on how we got to where we got to, that would strike me as the two principal sets of factors. Structural, change in the balance of power, personal in terms of the leadership admixture uh, of Xi Jinping, and then thirdly, the leadership's perception of how their external circumstances have radically changed for those three underpinning factors. So that brings us to what then should be done. Again, as I said this morning, uh, 
uh, Lenin's famous quote, what then should be done. Um, and uh, this has given rise to the book that I've written. Uh, it began really, and dare I mention its name in these hallowed halls, uh, when I was at Harvard, at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, uh, after I came second in the Australian national elections in 2013, that means I came last, um, and, I, and I lost. Bila, <laughs> bila, me bata. And uh, the guys at Harvard uh, asked me there to do some work on US-China relations. So not having a huge number of alternative offers on hand, off I went to Harvard. Um, but I began working on what I called uh, constructive realism. Uh, uh, in uh, a contradiction in terms of IR theory, by the way, uh, but a view uh, which was how do we develop a realist framework which has, um, shall we say, constructivist elements within it to sustain the US-China relationship as we entered into this period of enormous structural change. And this is pre frankly, uh, Trump, because I'm talking about the period 2014, 2015. Uh, and Xi Jinping was Gangang Gang Trump. And so, uh, so Xi Jinping, shall we say, more unique qualities after the 19th Party Congress had not been made fully manifest to the rest of the world by that stage. So I began trying to think this through. How could you create, and I use the term carefully here, a joint strategic framework, which might be possible for both countries to work within in order to manage the structural tensions within the, in, in the relationship. Given that the previous and pre-existing strategic logic of the US-China relationship, founded by Nixon and Kissinger and consummated by Brzezinski, uh, frankly, when uh, Professor Shambhal was working for Brzezinski uh, in the late 70s, uh, when diplomatic uh, normalization with uh, Beijing occurred. Given that all that strategic underpinning, which was an assumption that uh, the United States and China could form common a strategic condominium against the common Soviet threat, that has been removed. And so what therefore constitutes the future basis for this relationship? Of course, the second basis that was established um, was uh, during the period of uh, the 90s and the noughties. And, and just into the current decade, which was, let's call it, common economic advantage. That was done, that was worked through, and then began to reach its exhaustion point as well for a range of reasons, which you're all familiar with. Leading us to the present, uh, the most recently concluded and difficult decade, which is what therefore is the underpinning strategic rationale for this all important relationship? given its strategic and in part its common economic assumptions and politico-economic assumptions have been um, removed. Managed strategic competition, as I've explained in this book, um, has four simple principles, and I'll conclude on this because I'm mindful of the time. The four principles are as follows. Number one, the Beijing uh, and Washington at the highest levels now in private diplomacy uh, to reach a common understanding as to each other's deepest and most granular strategic red lines about their most core national interests that if breached in either direction would give rise uh, to unpredictable consequences. Not necessarily armed conflict, unpredictable consequences. Number two, to then concentrate the bulk of the energies in this relationship of strategic competition on enhancing each other's or enhancing each side's strategic competitiveness over time. Growing the economy, growing trade, growing investment, growing technology, growing finance, as well as expanding foreign policy influence and power, expanding and growing your military, in other words, fully competitive. It's a realist frame of analysis. This is not a kumbaya school of international relations, but if we only understood each other better and held hands in the corner at lunchtime, it would all be better by three o'clock in the afternoon. That didn't work that way. And the third uh, element in this four-part framework is to have the capacity within this framework for continued defined areas of strategic cooperation and even collaboration and even coordination where uh, 
The national interests of each side so determine that. The classic case in point, of course, is climate change, because it's existential for both countries. A classic case should have been common pandemic management, but we failed on that first time around, but we're not out of the pandemic woods yet, given the beautiful set of masks I see currently before me. Um, is objective evidence the pandemic ain't gone anywhere so far or for good. And thirdly, the really enduring challenge of um, global financial management and global financial stability. The debt burden now alive in the global financial system from states, from sovereigns coming out of this COVID-induced recession is beyond imagining. It's unprecedented in history. And coming on the back of the indebtedness which was accrued to many governments coming out of the global financial crisis, there is a rolling challenge in terms of global debt markets to ensure that we have no defaults. IMF, working overtime on this. You mentioned in my CV, I think, that I work on the external advisory group, money director of the IMF. Uh, those folk down there at the IMF don't get much sleep because below the radar, when none of us are watching because it never should be in the newspapers, there they are dealing with one small to medium-sized sovereign crisis after another. So global financial stability remains critical as well. The fourth and final part of the architecture is two sets of policemen on either side of the relationship. National Security Advisor on the American side, Secretary of State on the American side, possibly Chinese side, the Director uh, of the uh, Foreign Affairs Office of the Central Committee, currently Young Jiu Chu, on the Chinese side, plus the two vice chairs of the Central Military Commission on the Chinese side, a group of maximum four or five who become the ongoing day-to-day -day policemen of this three-part structure that I've described before. Strategic red lines, open strategic competition, and defined areas of cooperation. Now, people might say this sounds like uh, something which uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, would have come up with in the Summer Theologica uh, and trying to produce an elegant intellectual schemata which practical day-to-day -day policymakers would go, yeah, Kevin, you don't know what you're talking about. The problem is the alternative to that is just continued strategic drift, drift towards crisis, conflict and war. And I conclude with this. There's one alternative to managed strategic competition, and it's called unmanaged strategic competition. And where there's unmanaged strategic competition, there are no guardrails. Every issue every day becomes a potential crisis which ricochets out of control. And then we face the rolling crises that, frankly, our forebears faced back in 1914. My buddy from Harvard, Graham Allison, who wrote a book five years ago called Destined for War, and this is my response to my buddy's book, The Avoidable War. Uh, <laughs> David, uh, uh, Graham has always said to me in the period I've got to know him since those days in Harvard, is you can never overstudy World War I. I tend to agree with him because it's got a lot in common with some of the crises we face today. So it's my humble contribution uh, to the public policy debate in this country and in Beijing, um, having the book translated into Chinese, uh, to form a basis for a possible common strategic narrative. It doesn't wish away the differences, ideological, political, military, or strategic. It simply seeks to manage them. I thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Prime Minister Rudd, very much for the overview and the teasers of, of your uh, new book, which I have to say I've had the pleasure of reading over the weekend, cover to cover. There's um, and that really worries me, that No, no. <laughs> We're going to give you an exam now. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's quite a uh, contribution. It's very stimulating and it's very, very needed for the reasons you you just indicated. We're going to drill down now for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes or so uh, into some of these areas. Um, but first, I just want to welcome you, Kevin, to the Elwood School and to George Washington University. It's really a great honor and privilege for us to have you here today, particularly on the first day of publication of your, of your book. It's also a personal privilege because we've been sinological colleagues for, for some time. 
Um, and I've been an admirer and consumer of your wisdom on China and Asia uh, for many, many years. So I've learned a lot from you. Um, I would also observe, though, you're really good uh, insightful analyst of America, not just China. And sometimes not being from one country, you can see things more clearly about another country. So in some ways, you bring both of your psychological background and your years of watching and interacting with the United States at a high level into this volume. It's really, uh, it's quite a work. Uh, you used the COVID period very constructively, <laughs> I would say down under. Um, and it's very sobering advice for us Americans, certainly on how to craft our China policy during extremely difficult time in our, our relationship, put it mildly. We welcome that advice. We don't mind you interfering in our internal affairs at all. <laughs> I don't know, I hope the Chinese welcome your advice too, even though they do mind foreigners interfering in their internal affairs. But really there's a lot of very constructive uh, wisdom and, and advice that you offer. This is a very optimistic book. You know, Graham's book, uh, I don't know if I want to call it pessimistic, but destined for war tells you something. Uh, the avoidable war, of course, tells you something else. And, and so, you know, you give agency to humankind in this book. We're not on some sort of sleepwalking to Armageddon in this relationship. We can, I don't know if we can arrest these frictions. Um, I would suggest that we can. We simply have to share your view. We have to manage them. But if they're not managed, if they're unmanageable, as you, you just indicated, unmanageable competition is a uh, pathway you know, to a fully adversarial relationship, which could then become kinetic. Uh, and when you have two nuclear powers, where there are no guardrails. This is what concerns me and why you and I have been corresponding uh, over the last couple of years about the need for guardrails, buffers, frameworks, constraints that we had in Cold War 1.0 between the Soviets and Americans, but we don't have, uh, if this is Cold War 2.0 or whatever, however one wants to characterize the Sino-American relationship today, we, we don't have those buffers. So your book is a great contribution, I would say, to getting us to start thinking quite specifically about types of buffers, less an adversarial relationship and a war, and, and um, were to become a, a real possibility. You know, this is not fiction. And um, I'm glad it's, it's, it's very uh, sobering for, you know, to consider that. I like to call the US-China relationship, it's a very strained marriage but one where divorce is not an option. Right? We have to learn to manage these frictions, constrain them and uh, buffer them. Okay, so, but it accepts friction as, as the independent variable, you can say. So your book is all about the dependent variable in a sense. So let's drill down a little bit into several elements of, of your study. Um, start with the guard, guardrails. You know, first, you, you argue it, uh, in, in the last chapter, I guess, that, um, that managed strategic competition would involve establishing certain hard limits on each country's security policies. I was thinking as I read that on page 364, this is going to be very tough for these two countries to impose self-imposed limits. Now, these aren't countries, these two countries are, are, have exceptionalist personas. Right? And they don't exactly like their military establishments constrained by anybody else. So can you just talk a little bit about what you have in mind in the security domain here? Yeah. The um, school, David, just to, as I said this morning at the, the Willard, when we launched this book, um, Senator Romney, I uh, fully acknowledge the uh, work which um, David's done on, on managed competition as well. There's a whole bunch of us who've been trying to chisel away at this thing for a while, and this is just my amateur attempt to put some flesh on the bones. Um, and secondly, as I also said this morning, when you look at the, uh, the um, three-way structure that I have uh, outlined, strategic uh, guardrails, areas of unconstrained uh, competition, and then areas of defined strategic collaboration, the core challenge for this administration and its Chinese counterpart is then, as it were, to populate the chart. Um, I've given uh, crude headings and subheadings, 
I've uh, in the book argued as to how this might be saleable or not saleable in both Washington and Beijing. So I haven't just left it hanging in the breeze. Otherwise, it's not, not much more advanced, for example, than uh, public declarations about the need for what's the three way expression now from the State Department? I think it's uh, competition, mission, um, operation. Confrontation and co cooperation. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, strategy and operational strategy, and I'm not talking about a declaratory strategy, I'm talking about an operational strategy, has to populate these fields, identify the issues and the sub issues, and then work out as a matter of granular diplomatic reality. Uh, where the guardrails in the first category lie. Second point, let's go to the guardrails themselves, which is what we all prefer to avoid in public conversations, because this is where it gets really hard. Uh, what are they in terms of the issues first before the guardrails around them? Um, they are um, Taiwan, first and foremost, uh, East China Sea, Sankoku Gaida, second, uh, third, South China Sea, uh, fourth, depending on the future evolution of the Quad, what happens on the Sino-Indian border. Um, and fifth, what I would describe elliptically as cyber and space. Now, each of these involve already in the minds of the Central Military Commission from Yang Tishu, Wei Yang Hui, that mob in Beijing, a Bai building in Beijing. It occupies their mind and occupies the mind uh, of the Pentagon as well. Uh, and uh, so the question is, each of these systems is currently working out internally what they can tolerate and what they can't. Now, the question I have in my mind is simply this against those uh, sets of issues, is that do you discover by accident what the toleration points are, that is, through a series of actions and reactions on the high seas in the air or by countermeasures in cyber, how far you can go? That's the traditional method by which this is done. Or do you begin to reach through private diplomacy, nothing public, because that's just counterproductive, um, as to where the internal tipping points are? Let me give two topic examples. I'll start with an easier one, which is cyber. Um, then I'll try and give you a harder one, which is on uh, Treasure Island, Taiwan, um, and, um, and uh, where I studied as a kid, by the way. So um, uh, I lived in the mainland, not longer I've lived in Taiwan. On cyber, the de facto arrangements we have at the moment between China and the United States on cyber is that even though both sides are fully capable of taking down large slabs of the civilian economic infrastructure of each country, the de facto understanding, not de jure, de facto understanding at present is don't do that, because if you do, then we will double what we take down in your country. Now, my question, therefore, at an operational level in terms of enhancing stability and security is what is wrong with diplomatically beginning to codify, or as you Americans say, codify. Um, that reminds me of a fish, codify. Uh, <laughs> that's why we say codify. The, um, uh, the uh, this uh, set of understandings in terms of that, shall we say, mutual arrangement on cyber. Because let me tell you, in each country, you can have some cyber operators, particularly in the United States, who are a bit fast and loose in terms of their relationship with the official establishment. And we've seen evidence of that in China in particular in the last decade. Let me go to item two, uh, our example two, where I won't give the answer, but I'll define what the question is. You don't have to be a road scholar to work out, and I certainly am not one. Um, I was never smart enough to be a road scholar. You don't have to be a road scholar to work out that one of the options on the table for the Chinese military to demonstrate uh, both Taiwanese and American military impotence um, and a non-preparedness to go to war would be if the mainland tomorrow decided to take over Jinmen, okay, or Mazi, um, or one of the little islands, um, which if you go on your periodic visits to Xiamen, which I have, you stare at through your binoculars uh, from the Kongi side. I've done that myself. Um, so I can understand why the PLA might think this is a lot of fun. Uh, and I can understand on a bad day when the leadership in Beijing have really got the grumps 
uh, with what's going on in Taipei, some DPP debate internally. There's a new uh, DPP candidate emerging for 24 presidential elections. And how do we send a signal to these bunch of recalcitrant Taiwanese that this will not be tolerated and simultaneously send a message to Washington that we will demonstrate to all your friends and allies that you're ultimately impotent on the question of uh, defending, quote, the Lingtu of uh, Zhonghua Mingguo, the Republic of China on Taiwan. I know, we'll take one of these islands. There is a huge risk involved in doing that. God knows what the reaction would actually be in this town and in Tokyo and in Taipei for a whole series of, let's call it, domestic political variables, as you said. So I don't prescribe what the common understanding should be on Jinmen, Mazu and the offshore islands, but it's one of about 10 subgranular issues on a Taiwan escalation, uh, let's call it strategy, which I believe you need to have mutual understandings on. Of course, this doesn't prevent China from violating. They could do so unilaterally. But go back to my overriding principle, notwithstanding the four or five um, policemen, we could call them the four or five new horsemen of the apocalypse, these people acting as policemen of the relationship, um, they would be in the first position to know whether a quantum violation had occurred. Um, and you would have a very quick reaction from one side against the other. So there are two examples. Right. Well, let's let's build on on that um, and build out a little bit if, if we could next. You know, the, this situation is, in my view, not just a dyadic bilateral <clears throat> situation between the United States and China. Other countries also have agency in this relationship. And I'd like to ask you um, about other other countries, both as objects of the competition, because the U.S. and China relationship has now gone global. And we wrote a book about that once, once upon a time. Who <laughs> But I mean, literally, it's just like the Soviet American competition. That was a global competition. The US China relationship is now too. Anything with Ukraine, you know, you're absolutely right. And though you predicted this in book some time ago, it has been manifest in other domains. Ukraine finally consummates the reality that your book anticipated. It ain't just a regional uh, confrontation, it's now global. But I've also heard you speak earlier at different times about how third parties can be buffers, can be constrainers, not necessarily mediators, but can help constrain the, the tensions of this relationship. So I just wonder if, you know, if no country wants to be forced to choose, Li Xian Lung, Lung tells us repeatedly, don't force us to choose. All countries really want to have good relations with both the United States and China. So I'm curious about your thinking about other third parties, particularly in the Asia Pacific, but also perhaps in Europe? I think um, prior to around about 2017, I think that was a, a viable set of questions, and I've certainly spoken of it before. Since 17, where I think we've seen a much more direct manifestation of the Chinese assertiveness playbook around the world, not just within the Asia Pacific. It makes it harder and harder, bordering on the impossible for, let's call it third party, intelligent third party intervention. Uh, let me give you one example because you just mentioned Li Xianglong and I know the scenes region as well. Anyone here from Singapore before I offend our Singaporean friends? I'm a, I'm you, a fan of them. You're a fan of them? Um, yes. <laughs> I'm a fan of the Singaporean. I'm a fan of it too. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm privileged, having been prime minister, to spend time like this with uh, Lee Kuan Yew um, in the good old days. And uh, hi. The, uh, but, the, uh, but here's the point. If you look carefully at the Singaporean decision on the question of financial sanctions against Ukraine, sorry, against Russia over Ukraine, uh, the single most surprising development in Asia, and there's been a parallel development in Europe, has been for Singapore to join cause with the sanctions regime other than that mandated by the UN Security Council. Now, the Sings, as we call them in Australia, uh, the Singaporeans, um, I think have reached a conclusion that this has now gone too far. Now, this is a Russian action. It's not a Chinese action. But I begin to see from that, uh, David, that the idea 
of being the classic uh, Li Guan Yang and Li Kuan Yu intermediary to both sides, if Singapore is now indicating where its ultimate values and interests lie, then I'm not sure what other states so remain. And frankly, if you look at the European dimension, when you get to the point where even the Swiss, can I offend the Swiss? Anyone here from Switzerland? <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll offend the Swiss. So they're probably on the, we, the Asian society, have a center in Zurich, so I'll be very careful what I say. When the Swiss join these uh, sanctions arrangements against Russia, uh, Swiss, Switzerland is neutral and has, was neutral in the Second World War, so neutral on every other major element of the Cold War. So I begin to think the binaries are being pushed to a new level of extremes. So the honest answer to your question is if I, Look around the, the, the globe right now, and I skip through the geography of Asia. I cannot readily identify a country capable of, uh, of doing that with uh, an ability to moderate. Right. Well, let, let's stay with third parties for a second. And I have to take advantage of you being here to ask you about your own uh, country, Australia, which has been in Beijing's you might say proverbial penalty box for a few years now. We call it the sin bin in Australia. Sin bin. <laughs> you commit you a sin on a football game. You can yeah. head off for 10 minutes. That's what we call the sin. No, Beijing has used all kinds of coercive and intrusive pressures to both punish and influence Canberra's China policies in recent years. And Australia has really been at the leading edge in the world of countering China's influence operations, both and has set an example for other countries, including this one, uh, on how to legislate and to deal uh, with, with those. And Beijing just keeps continually ramping up the coercive economic and diplomatic pressure, you know, the 14 demands. And so I guess my question is what lessons for other countries that are coming under Beijing's pressures, of which the list is growing longer by the week, does the Australian experience suggest? What have you all learned down under that um, other countries uh, would usefully know if they come in into such coercive uh, sites of Beijing? Well, that is a scholar of these things, you know that Australia hasn't been the first cab off the rank. Mm -hmm. you know, this, um, well, the first canary down the Chinese mine shaft, as it were, because at various times in the last decade, you could point to countries like the ROK, Republic of Korea, uh, coercion um, over THAAD, uh, economic coercion, trade coercion, Taiwan itself, not a country, uh, the Philippines, uh, pre Duterte, but over the um, uh, ICJ case, and in Europe, uh, the Swedes, uh, now the Lithuanians, over Taiwan policy in the case of the Swedes, the treatment of their nationals. Um, to a lesser extent, the Canadians, uh, in terms of economic coercion, each of the cases is slightly different. But as you know, you're a student of Chinese history as much as I am. Uh, you, you understand where this comes in the imperial playbook. You know, uh, if uh, this is the way the emperor used to treat uh, vassal states um, who were not being appropriately vassal-like, uh, tributary states. Chicken was scared of the monkey. Yeah, shy eating by it. And, uh, and uh, kill one to, uh, to warn a hundred. So I hate to say to all of our Chinese friends that we foreign barbarians understand the playbook, okay? And, uh, and frankly, now most allies do in the United States. So what has been the unique Australian experience? It's kind of an odd transformation because you asked before, David, about third countries which were capable of, as it were, moderating and mediating. Historically, you know, Australia, while one of America's oldest allies, had a very strong relationship with Beijing through till, um, frankly, 13, 14, perhaps even to 15. Um, by the time China finished phase one of its island reclamation program in the South China Sea, when everyone said something's changed. Um, prior to that, uh, often during these crises in US-China relationship over the years, we Australians would quietly go in and have a chat to our friends in Beijing. Never talk about it, but that's what we used to do. Um, sometimes the Americans would welcome it, sometimes they wouldn't, and in reverse as well. That's not happening anymore. To go to the core of your question, what's Australia learned? Here is, a, here is my memo, my Beijing, the Yiko Beiwang, 
Beijing. Okay, it's my memorandum to Beijing. If you're going to pick on any country that is seek to economically coerce them, the worst country you could ever pick in the world will be Australia, because it's just in our nature. We're just not like that, you know. If um, it is just so culturally wrong for us in response to pressure to say, oh dear, we made a mistake, we're sorry we hurt your feelings. We will never do that. We never do that with the Yanks um, uh, in history. Uh, or the British, let alone the Chinese who belong to a completely different political system. So if the cardinal strategic error was, you know, wrong country, maybe go to someone within the Sinosphere uh, within the old uh, Confucian world, but certainly not to this country because the bipartisan response in Australia, even though my side of politics, the Labour Party, regularly critiques the Australian Conservative Party for objectively mishandling elements of the US-China relationship. As soon as you have the Global Times, you know, Huan Xiao Shiba, come out with the Shilun, which says, Australia is like a piece of chewing gum, which from time to time needs to be scraped off China's boot quote unquote let me tell you the reaction down under is screw you okay. <laughs> and that's kind of it you know so um, and we understand the depth of the leverage there's been probably oh you know a 25 percent reduction in bilateral trade uh this begins to impact uh, gdp growth in australia we understand that um and we also understand that our great and powerful friends in the united states in certain categories have moved in to the export and vacuum left by us as the Chinese seek to play us off against each other. Quite interesting play. But that's in the imperial playbooks as well. Look at the 19th century memorials to the Qing Emperor about how to use Meidi, uh, the American uh, imperialists, or the Meiyang, the American barbarians, to control the British barbarians. Yeah, Jiu Shi Jiu And uh, so it was just a wrong pick. Uh, and so I think when I go to Europe, for example, whether it's in Berlin or Paris or London, they say, how did you do that? And I wish I could say we're really smart down under, we're not, you know, it's like everybody else. But if you do something, we do react, and then we do it systematically and comprehensively. Um, and then we've assembled a range of legislative and regulatory measures with complete bipartisan support. Prior to that, there wasn't. Same things happen in this country. I dare say China has brought both parties together. So the two things that we agree across the aisle on is Senator Romney. Senator Romney said that today. Um, well, we've got time for me to ask you maybe one or two, possibly other, more questions before we go to audience Q and A, which I will moderate. So uh, Xi Jinping plays a pretty central role in your book. You have ten chapters, ten circles, you call them, about Xi Jinping, and you lay, I think, many of the stresses in the U.S.-China relationship really at Xi's doorstep. He's moved the needle on several areas that have exacerbated extant tensions. Not that tensions weren't there, but he sort of exager uh, exacerbated them. So the question I would have for you is how um, Xi-dependent versus how systemic do you see the frictions in the relationship? I mean, just it's kind of a black swan question. If she slipped in the bathtub tomorrow, I don't know if he takes bath, baths or how he takes showers, <laughs> but you know, if he something happened to she, which we don't expect, you know, we expect him to be, and you can use this as a chance to talk about your what you anticipate for him in domestic politics after the 20th Congress. You know, but say and never say never in Chinese politics. What if he were just sort of taken out of the uh, picture? Would the US-China relationship still have the stresses that uh, we see under his rule? Yeah, it's one of the two or three critical questions in China analysis domestically and in foreign policy right now, uh, which is structural continuity or personal leadership change. Um, uh, as I indicated in my remarks before, both factors are alive. There's a structural change. What is it? A change in the balance of power between China and the United States, militarily, economically, technologically, um, and there's a different uh, equation for each of those sub factors. And only the Chinese, with their Zongle Guoli system, comprehensive national power, end up with a final score, um, which is China ahead, America behind, even though that's not the case in every category. So that is the structure. Then you add um, the personal dynamic, uh, which is uh, leadership politics. 
And if you're into foreign policy analysis, the School of International Relations Theory or as a sub-school, it's deeply insightful, I think, in terms of understanding how individual leaders operate. And I believe it is a much bigger factor than some of the structural analysts would suggest. I say that in part as a practitioner, albeit a much smaller country, Australia, I know what difference political leaders make uh, on critical decisions. And I know the factors which impinge on their decision making. Look, I've never been a member of the Chinese Communist Party. I've never been to a Politburo meeting yet. I'm not likely to be invited. Okay. And I probably won't make the standing committee. That's my guess for the 20th Party Congress. You heard it from me. I won't be on the standing committee. But um, uh, you, I think there is an agreement that in terms of the centralization of power under Xi Jinping since 2012, which was rapid and fast in the 12 17 period, for all the reasons we're familiar with in this room, uh, that we now have um, an exceptionally powerful single leader, uh, less dependent on the disciplines of collective leadership than either Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin, that's my deep view, um, and arguably uh, less dependent on collective leadership than even Deng was, given that Deng almost existed dialectically with Chen Yun in the other corner. And if you've read the collected work, selected works of Chen Yun, if you've read the selected works of Deng Xiaoping, you know, this was, you know, Gai Ge and Bao Shou Pai. It was a easy, okay? Shi Yi Zhong, Gen Zheng, and it's like a dialectical analysis within, its, within itself. But not with this guy. Uh, he thinks that dialectical forces operate within his mind, okay? You don't need anyone else to be the dialectic against you. So put all that together, what's it mean? I think he is a significant decisive factor in changing what I would describe as the normal evolving structural tension in the US-China relationship to do this, if I was constructing a graph. As you know, and uh, I think it's uh, Rush Doshi's recent book has pointed out, the whole period of the change in the narrative about China's future destination militarily, economically, and foreign policy terms, you can see significant antecedents for it in the second term of Hu Jintao, starting from 2009. Certainly as an Australian government, we produced a defense white paper in 2009, when I was prime minister, directly responsive to observable changes in Chinese military behavior starting in 2008. And that's why we announced a doubling of the submarine fleet uh, then, and an increasing of our surface fleet by a third, because we could see quite immediate changes. But even that Hu Jintao period was doing this, and in the Xi Jinping period, it's gone like that. So that's my way of saying in answer to your question, if the bathtub intervened um, with soap or without soap, um, and, uh, and Uncle Xi took a tumble uh, for the worse, then I think it would have a measurable effect in returning the structure to a previous trajectory which still had as its ultimate destination point, if you read the original texts of Deng, and of Zhang, and of Hu, uh, that they weren't going to be Yong Yuan with Pao Guang Yang Wei, Zhe Bukang Tok. It's not going to be eternal, uh, hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Uh, it's going to change. But here is my point. In my analysis, it had multiple potential exit ramps in the future as yet undefined. Whereas Xi Jinping has decided that there is only one exit point, and it's the one I'm determining, and it actually brings us to a conflict point over Taiwan within historic time and not within a historic time. Okay, I'm just going to slip in one last sort of personal question for you before we go to the audience. Um, I didn't do it. We're all, you know, just, to some extent, we're all products of our professors. I like to think my students are products. You know, my classroom, but I want to ask you about your professor, Pierre Rickmont, who you studied under. That may not be a household name for this generation or for people. One reason he's not a household name is because he wrote under a pseudonym, Simone Lays. But I remember when I was a student, uh, actually right here at George Washington, uh, in, when his book, uh, Chinese Shadows, was published, it shook the field and had a really deep effect on me. I just wonder what impact residual impact of studying under Rickmans as a young person in your 20s has had on your own thinking about China subsequently. 
Yeah, Pierre Brickman's uh, drawing thing was actually Comat, and uh, he was uh, a Belgian Australian. Um, uh, did his uh, China studies at Louvain, I think, uh, and then um, went off and with the Belgian Foreign Service served for a little while in Beijing in '73. Um, couldn't stand it, um, and then for reasons I haven't quite tracked down, ended up in Australia. Um, I think possibly invited by the then still great C.P. Fitzgerald, who was still alive, um, Dean of Australian Psycho uh, Sinology, um, because he, Rickman was such a formidable uh, China scholar, particularly a classicist and an expert in Chinese uh, 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 his collection of um, copies of um, calligraphy and painting is just extraordinary. So anyway, here I am off a dairy farm in rural Queensland. And I arrived as an 18 year old at the university, the Australian National University in Canberra. Any Australians here? Okay, so I can be offensive towards my old school too. The, um, so, uh, but it does have a good uh, department of Chinese and a good uh, dairy farm, <laughs> a good uh, uh, disciplinary approach to the teaching of Chinese and Chinese history. So we wander into this class with this guy. I'm like, I, I don't know, up from down. You know? I've never been anywhere near a university in my life. Neither of my parents, by the way, have been to high school. So I'm classic rural. Normally, I think about it. You know, I don't have years, you know, when you don't have any class problems. And, you know, if there was a revolution tomorrow, I'd get through on class grounds. So um, any of you guys off the farm? Half and a half. So um, I was saying to David and uh, Senator Romney and the others earlier today, how did I end up doing what I'm doing? Part of the explanation is this. I grew up on a farm uh, in rural Queensland, which is kind of a cocktail between uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma. You know? And um, anyway, I'm sitting there on a horse as a 10 year old with my father as we were getting the cattle. And uh, he's on a big horse, I'm on a little horse, okay, a pony more or less. And he leans down to me one day and says, Kev, he says, I said, yes, dad. He said, have you decided on the big decision in life? Have you made your big decision yet? And I said, who? And he says, I didn't say this this morning. He literally said, you know, there's a big fork in the road and you face a decision about which way to go. And I'm thinking, God, this is about religion or what is it? I'm not <laughs> sure. Does he really know what I've been up to? <laughs> As a kid, you know. Anyway, you know, who did I steal that from? Oh, no. Anyway, so um, he said, no, the big choice in life. I said, Dad, I don't know what you mean. He said, your future, is it going to be beef or dairy? And, <laughs> and that's when I decided I had a big interest in foreign policy in the world. <laughs> So I started pinching all these books from our little bookshelf at home and just disappearing the other end of the farm and reading about anything. So university teachers have a huge effect and Pierre Rickman's instilled two things in me. One, the need for absolute thoroughness in your language study. Two, a love of Chinese aesthetics. Um, his ability to take a bunch of adolescent barbarians from every corner of the Australian continent and to capture their imagination with Chinese painting and calligraphy and the Chinese literary tradition, the philosophical tradition, to take us through uh, the Lunyu and to take us the Confucian analects and to take us through the uh, and, um, uh, and the classics he would just have a remarkable ability as a scholar to bring this alive for you in this very deep, heavily accented Belgian French, which most of us in Australia could barely understand. But the final thing, and this goes back to Chinese shadows, he was the first in the, I think, Western Academy by the time of the end of the Cultural Revolution. Chinese shadows came out about 74, did it? Yeah, uh, 74, exactly. Mm. Yeah. So, well, so I was still at high school, um, but uh, it was the first, as you said, to shake the academy. It basically ripped 
apart the veneer of what the Chinese Cultural Revolution really was, which was just an internal ugly power struggle between Mao and uh, those uh, who he feared most um, uh, within the Chinese Communist Party. And it was not some grand, great revolutionary movement. So this deep skepticism, skepticism he instilled in us about reading CCP documents and what they actually mean, as opposed to what they say they mean. Thorough in the language, in love with the culture and the civilization and tradition, and skeptical about uh, the ideological documents of the CCP. And students, important lessons. <laughs> okay, let's uh, transition to uh, Q and A. We've got uh, 20, 25 minutes to do that. I'm going to call on, we also have uh, questions online. It's a hybrid event. There are a number of maybe 200 people have been watching us uh, virtually. So we're gonna try and alternate questions in person uh, and uh, from, uh, from online. So I'm gonna start um, with this gentleman, I guess, since I saw his hand first. Yes, there's a microphone that will come to you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to um, bring another element. You started your conversation by referring to component. By referring to components of your brain. And that may be both where the problem and solution may be, not in IR, definitely not in IR. So as we bounce from one catastrophe, one predict preventable catastrophe to another preventable catastrophe, a pattern is emerging. And there may be something about our brains, what is called the neurotypical syndrome, which is uh, uh, defined as a neuro neurological disorder characterized by pre preoccupation with social concerns, delusions of superiority, and obsession with conformity. Maybe the neurotypical brain is not up to job and has to outsource this to neurodivergent brain, an idea that has come from Australia. Well, in Australia, we always worry about people who've got a brain, let um, alone what's in it. The, um, let me answer, answer your question this way. Um, I'm partly a scholar, partly. Unlike David, I'm not an esteemed scholar. I began well and then, as I said, drifted off and did other things. I'm now slowly returning to a form of scholarship. Um, but as a practitioner, political practitioner, as a foreign policy practitioner, as a prime minister, a foreign minister, and also as a diplomat in the field, uh, I'm convinced of a couple of factors. One, what the realists in international relations theory describe is in fact real. That is, there are material factors of power, not just as an ideation, but as a objective physical reality, uh, which both provide political decision makers with an opportunity to act. In other words, I'm going to send the aircraft from here to there and bomb that tank, um, witness what's happening on the screens now with Ukraine. And I also have a perception that the other side has more tanks than me, therefore I'm not going to act at all. So the realists have a deep insight, but it's not an exclusive insight because if you look at Mearsheimer's hyper-realism, which I'm fundamentally opposed to, it ultimately denies agency. That is, it basically says we're just on railroad tracks to doom. Sorry about that. Uh, he calls it the tragedy of... Uh, Great power power. Yeah, and I uh, have debated and defeated Mearsheimer in public debate in New York on this, <laughs> which he hasn't forgiven me for. Um, but I'm not an IR theorist, but I just think it's complete horseshit. Um, <laughs> because um, because uh, whether you're a, a political leader in Beijing or in Washington or an allied capital, we've all got agency. That's how we use it, frankly. Um, so that is the problem, the endemic problem of what I describe as hyper-realism. <clears throat> and therefore the notion of uh, the agency of leadership uh, and leadership agency, I think, is a critical addition to classical, or shall I say, um, hyper-realism. There's a third factor, though, also. And I'm not sure where within the international relations or political science or political psychology canon it fits, but let's, let's, pull, let's put it into structuralism, which is how do I think about and construct ideations of power, 
uh, which then, uh, frankly, have an influence on the way in which people behave. And so um, that, that is why, for example, I'm talking about a joint structure or joint framework for US-China relations, because structures can, some of them, can influence objective behaviour about whether I'm going to launch an attack on Ukraine or whether I don't, or whether I, as China, are going to support that attack or whether I won't. Now, in this third category, so realist power, um, a leadership agency, but also let's call it leadership cognition, and therefore cognition which gives rise to ideations about how uh, the world can, should, and now is operating and what to do about it. I do regard all three as being equally important. And to ignore one is to ignore part of the reality which is why this book of mine spends a lot of time talking about the American mind. A lot of this book talks about the Chinese mind. It talks about sui. It talks about the way of thinking. And many realists like Mearsheimer are completely dismissive of these underpinning what I describe as cultural ideational factors in which give rise to the way in which leaders think or the way in which they may ideate around structures. So final thought is this, and it's covered briefly, if you like, in the concluding uh, parts of my book. Why do we need a framework like I've outlined in this book to navigate what I call the decade of living dangerously? That's now, the 20s, through to maybe the early 30s, and I'm concerned about, you know, crisis over Taiwan by the time we get to the early 30s. We've got to get through this decade for a range of reasons, but one of them is just to allow some time for some different sui to emerge, different ways of thinking, different ways of ideating about our common challenges. And it might just be by the time we get to 2035, if we haven't blown each other's brains out in the meantime by a uh, large scale Sino-American war, that we then conclude, you know, really, what's more important for us both is to stop people dying from rapid terminal climate change in our cities and its profound and advancing impact on the way in which we live, to provide space for a new sewer or a new way of thinking. All three, I think, are structurally important. Uh, young man, gentleman in the second row. Yes. Wait for the microphone, please. <clears throat> So, uh, hi, Pro no, Prime Minister no, Ruth, and hi, no, Professor Shimbo. So, I have a question. So, for as we have no, have been improving our public health and fighting for the virus, and uh, as uh, no, China and China's People's no, National People's Assembly is approaching by the end of the year, how would you predict the uh, change of balance balance of power between the U.S. and China? throughout this year, especially by the end of this year? I don't think it'll change radically in the year 2022. Um, and I will answer your question with a slight divergence uh, in the response, which is in 2022, I'm more concerned about the balance of power within the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> um, and that what actually happens in the uh, aggregation of interests within the party as they make what will be a fundamentally important decision for the next 15 to 30 years, which is does Xi Jinping get a record, record third term or does he not? The overwhelming likelihood at this stage is that he will. But the headwinds against that are not inconsiderable. A slowing Chinese economy, number one. Pandemic has now jumped the border from Hong Kong into the mainland. And the Chinese Shenzhen Bull propaganda department has been telling all of us for two years. We authoritarians know how to run pandemics. You stupid little democratic capitalists, you don't. Um, and guess what? Oh, I'm a fun at all. It seems like an easy mushroom ladder. And, uh, and so we just made a mistake because suddenly the pandemics arrived. Whoops. Um, so that's a bit of a problem in terms of domestic political legitimacy. And then there's a further factor, which of course is how does uh, Xi Jinping's tacit support for Putin over Ukraine, over Ukraine now play out given that Putin's blitzkrieg on the way to Kiev has stalled. Put all that together, um, I think we are looking at a different set of, shall I say, factors uh, which uh, are coalescing in Chinese politics. If I'm a betting man, 
and Australians, we, in Australia, we bet on everything. Um, I would still put money in favour of Xi Jinping being reappointed, but it's now, I think, more contestable than it was. I'd give him odds at this stage of 70-30. If Putin was to fail totally in Ukraine, which he may, or if Putin was to fall in Moscow, and I'm not a Russia expert, I have no idea of knowing, then I think we're back to 50-50. That's kind of interesting. Okay, I'm going to ask a question that was asked online next, and then we'll, time permitting, go back to the audience. What is your sense of how the Chinese view their place in addressing this largest of challenges to them? How ready and willing are they to cooperate, compete, or confront with the West? It's a fundamental question, which I seek to address in the book, which is this notion of mine, managed strategic competition. Is it just me coming up with an elegant idea, as I think I said this morning, like Thomas Aquinas and Summa Theologica, you know, it looks elegant on paper, but frankly, it doesn't actually translate into anything that's useful. Or might we have a boutique audience with our friends in the State Department, the NSC, maybe. But what about the hardheads in Zhongnanhai and in uh, Bai and the Jinshu uh, Weiwan Hui, um, or in uh, the Wajiao Bu and the Yuguan Shito, the Anquan Bu, and that? Well, these are all valid questions because it's got to be a game, it's got to be a concept which actually translates across them. So, to answer the question, I think there are uh, two groups of scholars and researchers and policy advisors at work in Beijing at present. Uh, one which I describe as the Pai Ma Pi Pai, okay, <laughs> which is um, literally it's the Pat the Horse's Ass faction, which is no one willing to give um, uh, contrary advice. Uh, to Xi Jinping because it's not popular to do so and it's not career enhancing to do so. I think there's another group who are actually looking more broadly at the question of how do we manage the decade ahead in a manner which does not undermine our national interests, which stabilizes the relationship, which enables us to do what Xi Jinping has sought to do on uh, climate change, which enables us to do what the, um, the Jindui are doing in terms of their and it still enables us to uh, avoid uh, an unnecessary crisis in the, in the Nanhai. Now, there's a group of people in Beijing uh, working on these questions as well. Would they agree with the formalization that I've given in this book? Not sure. Um, they'll read it, and I intend to have it put into Chinese. I think, I think it's being translated as we speak. Uh, how widely it will be circulated in China, given I have a few unfriendly things to say in there don't know. But what David and I have learned over the years is that if you've got an idea, get it up and out there, you never know what influence it might have. Are you willing to have your book censored in order to get into print in China? Depends which part they want to censor. <laughs> if it's the, um, and I've crossed that threshold many times before in China, as we all have. Right. And I kind of have a view that so long as the core proposition is up there, uh, then I think you can ride with it. Listen. Can you speak a little bit more about how you treat the questions of economic competition between the United States and China? So many elements of the tensions in the relationship uh, are in the economic realm. It makes it very different from the actual Cold War in the 20th century. No, you're absolutely right. And, um, and so, and as you know, if you went through the spectrum of economic engagements, each of the answers to each element of the spectrum are different on trade. Uh, and supply chains, then there are multiple tensions on both sides of this relationship, both in Washington and in Beijing. But frankly, there is a general view, given the relative significance of trade to both countries, is we should get out of the road of impeding unnecessarily bilateral trade flows minus the category of high technology, okay? And certainly minus the category of semiconductors. Um, or minus the category of certain categories of semiconductors, to be more precise. Um, if you go to FDI flows, foreign direct investment, the truth is, uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, it's for the, since uh, Trump was president, it's been slowing in both directions since about, I think, 2018. I stand to be corrected on the most recent numbers. And that is corporations making their own decisions 
um, in quantum about whether this is wise to proceed given the aggregation of country risk, which is accumulating. So trade, immediate transaction, bang, bang, I send you a check, you send me a bunch of widgets. Good, gone, end of geopolitical risk. Investment, I'm there for seven years. Whoops, uh, we have a crisis. And then God knows what happens. Capital markets is a different question again. Uh, and that is um, more vexed and uh, complex probably than we have time for here. But if I speak to the players in capital markets in Hong Kong and Shanghai and in New York, which is where the Asia Society is based, there are a thousand different answers to that question. Guess how big the joint capital market is between China and the United States right now? It's five trillion bucks. That's quite a reasonable amount of loose cash. You know, you're talking about... Um, 25% of American GDP there. Um, so to unscramble that omelette, you're going to end up in, frankly, a mess, which is why when you hear people loosely say, well, we should consider secondary financial sanctions against China if they violate primary sanctions against Russia over Ukraine, understand what it is you wish for in terms of how the unscrambling of that financial omelette uh, might uh, turn out. Finally, on technology and talent. Uh, technology... Um, the live debate here, not just with the CHIPS Act, uh, but uh, with the other elements of restrictions on uh, potential restrictions on uh, US companies to China for let's call it lower grade uh, microprocessors um, as opposed to the most advanced grade. Uh, there's a slow consensus emerging, but it's still not done in this country. China's response is Zili uh, Gongsheng, national self reliance. Which is, let's have national self reliance by this afternoon, not tomorrow, because it'll be too late. Xi Jinping has already sort of embarked upon that one. So, as I said, I think the answers to the subcategories of the economic question are each different. So, with an eye on the clock, I think we have time just to squeeze in one more question. I'm going to look at this side of the room. So, um, why don't we go to you here? And um, then Please, brief question, brief response, and we can end on time. I think the brief response is directed at me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my question, uh, thank you for coming up to Prime Minister, is about the ANZUS alliance now that's at 70, specifically its role in a Taiwan contingency. Uh, Hugh White recently said that he sort of suggested that ANZUS would not be invoked unless the US had a very high probability of winning, which he does not see as happening. Uh, at what point do you think Article 4 could be invoked in Taiwan contingency, or what are the odds, and what kind of scenario would require it to be invoked? This is the question which all Australian politicians seek to avoid. Answering directly. <laughs> so watch the elegance with which I avoid the question. <laughs> Answers Treaty, 1951. So... Um, History is kind of interesting because it was uh, just uh, brought about, and I'm mindful of the clock, 60 seconds, it was brought about to assure the Australians that as uh, the United States moved towards a peace treaty with Japan and joint defence uh, treaty with Japan, that um, we would receive parallel security guarantees given the level of Australian trauma about the, the Japanese uh, um, uh, military campaign uh, during the Pacific War. That's the origins. Try to tell that to our friends in Beijing that it's uh, Kang Ru. Uh, that is, it's anti Japanese in its origin. They don't believe you. But that's actually what happened. Secondly, um, the clauses uh, in Article 4, which you refer to, are a little different to those in Article 5 in NATO, but it's worth studying. Uh, there are two sets of provisions. Uh, one is that if the armed forces of either party come under attack in the Pacific area, then they shall. Uh, meet to confront the common danger. Then if the territory of either party uh, comes under attack, then we shall meet to act against the common foe. Language that effect. By the way, it's only been operationalised once since 40, since 51. Do you know when? Yeah, for the September 11th. Because you guys came under attack in the United States. So we invoked it and then we sent off thousands of troops to Afghanistan. So um, that's the history. No Australian political leader, either of the centre-right or the centre-left, since 1951 has ever publicly uh, said uh, whether uh, or not uh, the ANZUS Treaty would be operationalised over Taiwan. And there's partly a, there's an underpinning logic for that. It is, again, that 
if you accept the ultimate wisdom of strategic ambiguity in the United States on Taiwan, in order to act as a corrective element within Taiwanese domestic politics, which is that if you really misbehave in Taiwan, as the Chen Shui bian administration did between 2000 and 2008, from memory, um, then we don't want to give you sucker that you can go ahead and UDI your own, uh, your own uh, formal independence from the mainland and expect the Fifth Cavalry uh, and its friends and relations, that's us, to come riding in to save you from your own decision. So there is some ultimately some wisdom in maintaining ambiguous on ambiguity on this question. I told you I would be artful. Thank you. Thank you. Dean Ayers is going to close the event, but I can unambiguously recommend uh, Prime Minister Rudd's book to everyone. I believe we have some copies in the back for purchase and signing. Over there, um, over there yeah. Um, you can have it autographed by Prime Minister Rudd. Um, it's, and I just, again, thank you for sharing your, your new book and unpacking some of the richness in it um, with us today and coming to the Elliott School. We're just really honored to have had you here today, Kevin. Please return in the future. Thank you so and, much. And, this and I echo Professor Shamba's encouragement for everyone to take a look at the books that we have for sale in the back and get them autographed. Thank you, Prime Minister Rudd, for debuting your book with us today here. And thanks to all of you for joining us. <laughs>